All right, let's stand this again this morning as we get to praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Both of you, thank you. It's good. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. You may be seated. If you're one of our guests today, my name's Tom, and I'm one of the pastors here, and so grateful that you've joined us today. And if you're watching online, we'll welcome you guys just in a second as well. But I wanted to, obviously, when we start a service from the baptistry, you know some significant things have happened in the lives of people. And what's happened is we have six people who have given their life to Christ. Two of these are father-sons that we're going to be baptizing today. And, and it's just an amazing thing to see how God continues, continues to work in, in the lives of our, of our folks. Um, if, if you don't know that much about baptism, uh, let me tell you a quick little story, okay? Um, I had a friend who came to my church years and years ago. He was more faithful than, than anybody who came. He was there every time the doors were open. And, and we wanted to put him in leadership because he, he was there so much. Uh, and he loved the Lord, but he had never been baptized. And we kept asking him why. And he said, well, you know, I was baptized when I was a baby, you know. And uh, so we asked him, you know, well, whose decision was that? What was my mom and dad's decision? And it was a great decision. Because what they were saying when he was a baby was, we really want our child to follow, follow God. And he did. So when it came time for us asking him about being baptized, he kept pushing it off. He said, I was baptized when I was a baby. And then one day, he comes to me and he says, I really want to get baptized. And I said, okay, that's great. What, 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 what changed that? He said, I was reading my Bible, which he read all the time. And he said, I read this part where it said that when Jesus was baptized, that God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he said, all I want to do is please Jesus. And if God was pleased when his son was baptized, then I should... I should do that same thing because I know he'll be pleased. Everyone that you see baptized today are pleasing God because what they're saying is, I made a commitment to God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for my sin. I'm born again, and I just want to tell everybody about that. So this is a big deal. It's a big deal for them, and perhaps it might be a big deal for you if you've never been baptized. So... Um, we're going to start off with uh, William Jonasey is going to be baptized. His dad's going to be baptized. Adam will be baptized right after that. And so, William, why don't you come on down? The water's nice, bud. Come on, here we go. This is William Jonasey. William tells me that it was his mom, Megan, who was most influential in his life for him to come to know Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, and also uh, MCS, Maryville Christian School, our school here was very impactful in him coming to know Christ. So William, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There you go. Okay. Hey, buddy. You want to stand right there and watch Daddy get baptized? All right. This is William's dad. This is Adam. Adam also says that his wife, Megan, was very influential in him getting to this point and uh, receiving Christ and following him. It's a big day for you guys. It's great. Adam, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is Mason Richard. Everybody say, hi, Mason. Okay, Mason, remember how we practice? Okay, there you go. All right. Uh, oh, I, I really messed up. Uh, I didn't have all you guys who knew Adam and William to stand and support them. I'm sorry I didn't do that. Would you, even though they can't see you right now, would all you guys that were, were here to support Adam and uh, William, would you guys just stand right now? Great, great. Keep standing. That's great, yeah. You all keep standing, and we're going to add Mason's folks who uh, are excited about Mason being baptized and want to support him. So everybody who's here to support Mason, Richard, and his dad, they're going to be baptized. And Mason said that his mom, yeah, Mason said that it was his mom that was very influential in him coming to know Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And so Mason, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
Good job. This is Mason's dad. This is Ryan. We're going to make it. Okay. <laughs> um, Ryan tells me also that uh, Jen, his, his wife, was very influential in him coming to this point of following Christ publicly like this. So Ryan, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Great job, man. This is Amy Jansen. Amy also tells me it was her mom who, uh, boy, you guys are good. Look at you. I don't even have to ask for you to stand. That's great. Amy tells me that it was her mom that was the most influential one in her life coming to know Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. So Amy, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is Sarah Rayborn, and um, if we have everybody standing for Sarah, I guess, um, if there's others, please stand. She says that the people that were most influential in her coming to know Christ as her personal Lord and Savior were Tim and Becky Kalb and, and, and Lindsay Tracy, right. Sarah, upon your profession of faith now, Jesus is Lord and Savior, and now in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Great job. Is this not incredible? My, my, um, I, I love this. I could do this all day. And um, you'll notice how many people, uh, their family was influential or their close friends, just uh, inviting them to church. And, and God, God's just so gracious to us bringing us so many great people that want to follow him. If you're thinking about baptism, you take that card that you received when you came in and just write that. I'd like to know more about baptism. And then at the end of the service, you can drop that off at uh, the baskets that people will be holding at the doors when you leave. And we'll get in touch with you and, um, and help you make that next step and talk to you about it, okay? Cindy? Hey, Pastor Tom. We'd love to see you up there baptizing all day long. Hey, everybody, and welcome. We are so glad that you all are here. And uh, we've got folks that are joining us online right now, and they would love to hear a warm welcome from you. Will you put your hands together and welcome them? Good morning. Welcome to you online. And I am sure you're probably tuning in to watch your family members be baptized. And if you are visiting here today, just because of that very reason, you had a loved one um, who was baptized today, or maybe it's your first time walking in the door and you've never been here with us before. We're honored that you were here, and if you've got a minute, we'd love to meet you. And that means you got to come by our welcome reception room. You'll find us over to the right, and we'll greet you and thank you for coming in. And if you've got questions, we're here to do our best and answer them for you. And as you can see by um, the way that our stage is all set up, we're about ready to do something pretty exciting here at FB Maryville. One of the best Best weeks ever, and that's Vacation Bible School, will start tomorrow night here in person, and we are so thrilled for that. And also another program that we do during the summer that's really special is we have what's called the Backpack Blowout. And this is an opportunity for us to help fill a backpack for a young child who, who may not have the ability to have the supplies that they need to get ready to go back to school. So a couple of ways you can do that. You can go online and sponsor a backpack, and so fill up that backpack. You can also take an apple off the tree, and the tree's in the lobby. Just pull an apple from the tree and um, shop and get the things that are on that apple. And then we ask that you bring these back by July the 25th um, so that we can get everything ready. And then we'll be giving those backpacks packs out on August the 7th. So if you want to be a part of that really special day, you can go online and sign up to be a part of that as well. I'm going to invite you all to stand up because y'all are so friendly. Yes, you are. And I'm going to tell you to buckle up because today's message is, is amazing. But to gear up for this message is about worship. And the worship today is just out of this world. So um, I'm just praying that God's going to reveal himself to you in such a mighty way and that you can bring God your very best today in praise and worship. But before we do that, how about y'all just say hi to everybody. If I send them out-ish, out-ish, <laughs> will you bring them back? 
Will you? Okay, very good. You get, you get eight seconds. Say hello to someone this morning.
be so faithful. I just wanted to share a few words of encouragement before we head into our final song in the set. And these verses come from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it's the story of King Jehoshaphat, and he is getting ready to go to battle against three very large armies. He consults the advice of a prophet, and this is what the Lord says. <sighs> Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast number, for the battle is not yours but God's. You do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. Then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord and some to praise the splendor of his holiness. When they went out in front of the battle, they were singing. Give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. The moment they began their shouts and praises, the Lord sent an ambush against the Amorites, the Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Sir, and they were defeated. Church, I love this story for so many reasons, but I love, what I love most is what happens when we worship and sing. Worship in our, has such power. It has power to annihilate our enemies and annihilate the battle in front of us. So today, church, I don't know what your battle is. I don't know if you're on the mountaintop, but regardless, I want to be like King Jehoshaphat. I want to position myself. I want to stand still, and I want to see the salvation of the Lord today. You know what King Jehoshaphat's position was? It was worship. It has power, church. Do not underestimate it. Do not underestimate it. Praise the Lord today, just as King Jehoshaphat and his army did. They sang, give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. That's what they were singing. It has power. So in this song that we're getting ready to sing, claim it, proclaim it over your battle or over your mountaintop. But let's worship today and let's, oh, let's annihilate our enemies. Come on.
God, for reminding us, God, of what our position should and is, God, should be and what it is, God, our position should always be to praise you and to glorify you, God, to sing of your splendor. You deserve it all, God. Thank you, God, for equipping us, God, for providing us everything we need to face our battles, everything. The strongest weapon of all, God, our worship and our praise, God, all we have to do, God, is position ourselves to stand firm see your salvation. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promise. God, you can, you can never go back on your word. God, it is true. Lord, remind us of that today. God, for the battles that are represented amongst us today. God, I pray peace in the storm. God, I pray peace upon it. I pray answers come. I pray clarity. I pray healing in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names. Meet us here today. Be with Pastor Thomas. He brings the word speak through him to speak to us, God, and help us to receive it in your name. We ask all of this. Precious name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everyone out today, and thank you all so much, you guys who are watching us online today, from not only locally and regionally, but actually around the world. Did we welcome those folks this morning? Make sure we clap for them, okay? That takes a lot, and we have a lot of people that are typically here but are on vacation, and they're uh, listening to us or watching us as they're... Um, on vacation, and so we're so grateful for that. And that's so important to stay connected. So we're in this series called Meals with the Master, and uh, let me start off today by asking you, how many of you all are outdoor people, outdoor folks? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a trick question. Some people are going, uh, I like AC. That's, that's how I roll, yeah. So, so today's meal is going to be an outdoor meal. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of a disclaimer here. I know that if you've been around church for a while, or you were as a kid, you heard this story that we're going to talk about today, uh, I don't want you to let familiarity breed contempt, and what I mean by that is I don't want you to say, oh, I've heard this before, uh, this is really a big deal. And if you've never been around church, or you're new to the Bible, uh, this is going to be an amazing thing. Just open up your mind to something that's going to be truly, truly amazing. What this is typically known as is the feeding of the 5,000. Now let me tell you what's significant about this, or one of, the, one of the theological things that's significant about it, and that is outside of the resurrection of Jesus, this is the only miracle that's mentioned in all four of the gospel writings. Now when I say gospel writings, what I'm talking about is the Jesus literature, which is the first four books of uh, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what we're going to do today, uh, you'll see some scriptures pop up on the screen that will be from all these four different books, but they're still dealing with the same event, with this, um, with this great meal, of this epic picnic, okay? Um, now, leading up to this, before Jesus feeds the 5,000, let me tell you what's going, going on. Jesus has sent out his disciples, and he sent them on a mission trip. Uh, you guys been on mission trips before? Some of you have. Um, I remember the first mission trip I ever went on, I was the leader. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's a recipe for catastrophe. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, but God was gracious and nobody uh, got hurt or anything. But uh, whenever you go on a mission trip, this is what I found, that two things happen when you come back from a mission trip. Number one, you're excited about all the things that you saw God do. And the second thing is, you're exhausted, and you're tired. And so Jesus sends uh, these guys out, sends his disciples out, and they're doing incredible things, and they're seeing God work like they'd never seen him before. And they get back, they come back to Jesus, and they're, they're tired, okay? And notice what Jesus says to them right here. Uh, he says, the apostle, it says, the apostles returned 
to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. And he said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. Well, when you don't have time to eat, you're too busy to eat, you're too busy, right? So Jesus says, hey, we, we just need to escape from the crowds here for a little bit. You guys need to rest up, and we need to get away because people, here's a little truth. You might not listen to anything else that's said this morning. Remember this, people will wear you out. Can I get an amen? All right, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want this type of amen. Amen. I didn't want that, okay? I just wanted an understanding that people wear you out, okay? So we know this, that people wear us out. And Jesus knew this, and so he said to the disciples, listen, there's so many people here. You've had a great time. Let's, let's, um, let's get out of here. In fact, what Jesus did, he makes arrangements for a boat, that they're going to get on a boat, and they're just going to sail away from people. And, and I want to show you the map here. I'm, I'm kind of... I'm kind of a map guy. Okay, and so this is the Sea of Galilee. This is where this was located, where they were. Capernaum right here, that is uh, kind of Jesus' headquarters. He did a lot of miracles there. He did a lot of ministry there. And so what, they, what he did, and see how it's a coastal city, what he did was he, he, he arranged for a boat, and he got his disciples on the boat, and they started heading this direction towards Bethsaida. That's what he started doing. And so what we're going to be talking about today is this great picnic that takes place, this great meal that takes place of all these people, because what happened was uh, he gets in the boat, and they start off their way, and as they start on their way, they notice something. They look over on the shore, and a bunch of people are following them as they're sailing down the coastline. And what are you saying, Tom? You know, what, 5, 10, 15, 30? I mean, um, the head count was just of the men, and there was 5,000. And so there was more than 5,000. I mean, you add women and children to that. It could have been seven to 10,000 people. And can you imagine that size of crowd? And they're following Jesus along, and, and the, the boat, the disciples, they're following them along the, the coastline. So what, what I want us to do is, what we're going to talk about today is we're talking about four essentials for an amazing picnic. For you guys who are the outsiders, and, and some of you just, you know, bear with me if you're not an outdoor person. I know, just add to your list air conditioning. Okay, but for, for the sake of this uh, text where we are, four amazing elements, uh, essentials for an amazing picnic. Here's the first essential, and that is the host. We need a good host, right? And who's the host of this picnic that's going to take place? It's going to be Jesus, but before we jump into that, I want you to take a look at this passage of Scripture, uh, which is taken from Mark. Now, Mark chapter 6 is where we are on, but remember, we're going to be around Matthew 14, we're going to be around Luke 9 and John 6. Mark, Mark 6, 32 and 33, so they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. <laughs> and they were not alone. Look at this next verse, verse 33. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Now, I don't know how you guys handle interruptions in your life. Um, for me, sometimes I want to avoid those interruptions that I see coming my way and I'll run or hide or do something, you know, that I just don't want to be around or, or withdraw. That's what Jesus did many times as he withdrew from a crowd. Uh, this is different. Jesus handles this one completely different. I mean, he doesn't, he, he sees the people that are going uh, alongside the shoreline and so they pull in around a port around Bethsaida, and look, look at what happens. It says this about Jesus, how he approached it. Well, there's the, there's the map again. So he's going over to Bethsaida here. But notice it says in verse 34, still in the Mark chapter 6, it says, Jesus saw the huge crowd, and as he stepped from the boat and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. So he doesn't treat this interruption as turn the boat around or let's go out into deeper waters, they won't find us there. He doesn't do that. He pulls us, let's dock, and we, they dock the boat and he jumps off the boat and when he steps on, it says that he had compassion on them. Well, why? Uh, these people uh, 
have been kind of draining to them, but yet he has compassion on them. Why? Because, notice here it says, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, we live, uh, a lot of us, in the Metro East, and I don't get out much, but I haven't seen a lot of shepherds and sheep. Have you? Do you know where they are in the Metro East? Are there some? I mean, we, we, we're not used to that, are we? Uh, so let me kind of give you a little bit of a... Um, step back into time what this looked like here's what a shepherd here's the shepherd he's on a donkey right there and there's a shepherd and this is all the sheep and you can see it's dirty you can't smell it but it smells and all these sheep that's what the shepherd that's what it looks like now what Jesus is saying is the people that he saw that were following them along a coastline were like these without this they were sheep without a shepherd Which makes us ask this question, what do shepherds do? Well, shepherds lead their sheep. So he saw these people as people without a leader, without an influencer to lead them in the right direction. He he saw that another thing that shepherds do is shepherds know their sheep. Now, some shepherds I've heard even name their sheep. And... He, a shepherd, knows their sheep. So Jesus sees them like a sheep without a shepherd. And not only does a shepherd know his sheep, here's another thing I think is interesting. I read this. Sheep know their shepherd. Uh, Like if you take a, uh, see this watering hole or whatever, and you have several flocks of sheep at this watering hole, one shepherd can start calling his sheep, and no sheep will leave the watering hole because they're so in tune with the voice of their shepherd. Now, obviously, sometimes he has to come and get some of them, but most of them would follow him. Uh, Here's here's another characteristic about sheep. Aren't you glad you came today because this is such a need in your life because there's so many shepherds with sheep around Metro East. You're thinking, boy, this is really helpful. Two more things about it. The shepherd shepherd protected the sheep. Um, That picture had the shepherd, he had a staff. That had a, a hook on it, that hook would get them out of tight spots. It also was long where he could reach out and just kind of lay the staff on the side of the sheep to direct it into a different direction if it was going in the wrong direction. A shepherd protected it. Now, now we know that David, King David, back in the Old Testament, he was a shepherd. And when he went up against Goliath, you remember the David and Goliath story? His credentials that he gave to King Saul was, I killed, I watched over my sheep and I killed a bear and I killed a lion. And so the shepherd... uh, defends and protects the sheep and then the last thing is is the is the shepherd uh he cares for the sheep when they're sick he gives them medicine he takes care of them that that's that's what jesus sees these people as he sees these people as people like sheep without a shepherd they needed a shepherd i just want to pause and ask you this have you ever considered jesus as your shepherd because our take today on this feeding of the 5,000, and you've probably heard jillions of sermons on the feeding of the 5,000, or you've done Bible studies on the feeding of the 5,000, but our perspective that we're looking at today is I believe one of the reasons that it was so important that these gospel writers, each one of them, thought it was significant enough to put in their writings was because they wanted us, the readers, to know who Jesus is. Because many times we don't look at Jesus for who he is we look at him for who we want him to be. We look at him based on what's going on in our life. And we're bringing him into our life saying, do this for me or do that for me. And I believe the writers are put all this together in their their writings so that the readers would understand, no, 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 he's not necessarily who you view him as if you're just viewing him as your Jesus. Uh, he's, he's, he's a little bit bigger than that. In fact, he probably doesn't have the same agenda that you have. And the writers, the gospel writers, put this story in there so we could grab a hold of some of those truths of what Jesus, their perspective of, of who Jesus really is. So, uh, first of all, he's the host, and it's important for an amazing picnic that you have a great host. The second thing that's important for... Um, a great amazing picnic second essential is this is the setting I don't know where your settings are when you have a great picnic but this uh, this is important now I'm gonna go back to the map here and gonna show you um, this setting a little bit now remember they're over here by Bethsaida right now 
Now, this is a unique spot. And the reason that this is a unique spot is because in this area, there's, there's a lot of uh, zealots, okay? This little town over here called Gamla, we're going to come back to that in a second, but this little town here called Gamla, this is where the zealot movement started. Okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit, I guess. Um, zealot, I need to explain what a zealot is. Okay, let me help you out. A zealot, this would be a zealot, okay? That <laughs> would be a zealot. Now, you know, in the first hour, somebody actually started booing, and I said, wait, 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 wait you know, be gentle. I mean, we could have had Cardinal tickets up, or Cardinal uh, fans up there. So, so a zealot in, uh, and you can take it down, because that's all people are going to be thinking about now. Okay. So a zealot um, hated Rome. A zealot hated the Roman taxes. Um, uh, a zealot wanted to, not only did they hate Rome and they hated the Roman taxes, they were so tired of the Roman presence in their villages and towns. They were so tired of going to the temple and seeing this, this Roman fortress right next to the wall of the, of the temple. They were so tired of that presence. They were so tired of Roman soldiers making them carry their pack, not one mile, but two miles, etc. They were so tired of Roman uh, presence that they wanted to fight against them, and that's who the zealots were, and these are the ones that show up in this area. Now, to give you a little bit of history of, of, um, of the zealots, they, they were, remember I told you they, were, uh, they started in Gamla. Now, now, there was this guy named Judah of Gamla. He's not a biblical character, but he's a historical character. Uh, other historical writers during that time noted that Judah of Gamla, or Judah of Galilee, sometimes he's referred to, um, he, was, he, he was a revolutionary, his dad was a revolutionary, his sons were revolutionaries, and they were all against Rome, and they, they wanted to, to push back. In fact, a couple of decades after this, this meal that Jesus fed so many people, uh, they had a little success, a little military success, against Rome. Uh, it didn't last long, uh, but first of all, let me show you Gamla uh, real quick. This is, um, this is what Gamla looked like, this hillside here. Actually, the word Gamla means camel, and so you see this kind of a hump, hump back here, and then here are some of the ruins. We're going to talk about the ruins here just in a second, because um, what happened was this new leader of Rome took over, and his name was Vespasian. Vespasian, here's what Vespasian looks like. He's kind of a hard, cold guy. <laughs> okay. But uh, Vespasian was a ruthless Roman leader and military leader and came in and just destroyed Gamla, destroyed Jerusalem, um, and it was, it was awful. Now, I'll give you an example. Here's some of the ruins of, of Gamla. Uh, here's some of the walls, and you can see some of the walls knocked down here. And what they use, they use this Bastilla uh, military uh, tool, and they fired these stones. And let me show you the stones. They look like this. And actually, the stones are called nuclei. Uh, interesting name. And, and, and so they destroyed, they destroyed Gamla. That's where the zealots were. But I'm getting ahead of myself because, remember, Jesus just got off the boat. And when he got off the boat, he started healing people. But among the crowd, in the setting, remember that's what we're talking about, in the setting are these zealots. And these zealots have a plan. Uh, yes, it's against Rome, but it's even more significant. And as we look at John's account of this feeding of the 5,000, in John chapter 6, verse 15, take a look at this. It says, Jesus, knowing that they, we're talking about people that are in the crowd, that mainly the zealots, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Uh, just Put that in your back of your mind, that whole mountain by himself. Uh, we'll come back to that. But you see what's happening here? Uh, Jesus gets off the boat. They've just had this great mission trip. Jesus says, let's get away from the crowds. The crowds follow him. They get to Bethsaida. Jesus steps off the boat. And the scripture says that he welcomed the people there and that he started healing people there. And so this is going on. And, but in the crowd, there are these zealots, and they're saying he's, he's our leader. He's the one that can help us defeat Rome. Uh, let me stop right there, and let's, let's just kind of unpack that a little bit. Their view of Jesus 
possibly is different than your view of Jesus, or maybe not. The zealot's view of Jesus was this. He's a pawn for our movement. You see, Jesus did not come to be a pawn for anyone's movement. Jesus came to be the movement. And many of you, your lives have been changed as you got to know Jesus a little bit better. Sometimes this takes place very quickly, and you are transformed very quickly. I've seen people that were drug addicts that turned into preachers. I mean, they just did this 180, and it happened overnight. But more times than not, it takes about five years or so, or sometimes even longer. But there's this steady calling that God has on our life. And he gradually, we sense, we read his word, and gradually there's this transformation, that, this process that takes place. And some of you might be in that process. Some of you might be at the very beginning of that process. But nothing's random. God is, God is working, okay? And, and you can see that just as we baptized people this morning. You can see how God has worked in their, those lives. And maybe God is working in some of your all's lives as well. But I, I, I digress a little bit. Here we have these zealots, and they're saying, let's make him king. Because, man, if he can heal people, and he's going to get a big following, and we're going to turn him into a military leader. And I just want you to know that Jesus is not interested in our plans for him. He is interested in his plans for us. He's interested in us experiencing his plans. Um, try this saying out, if you will, for your life. Um, we do not follow Jesus so he can get us to where we're going. We follow Jesus so we can get to where he's going. Let me say that again. We don't follow Jesus to get where we are going. We follow Jesus to get where he is going. So many today, I'm afraid, they, they look at Jesus and they say, if I obey him then he'll give me the relationship. If I obey him, then he'll give me the cure. If I obey him, then he'll give me the house. If I obey him, then he will give me the finances. And, and folks, that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is not the great vending machine in the sky that I put in this quarter of obedience and then he's going to bless me with A, B, C, or D. He's not interested in being an addendum to our life. He is interested in taking over our life. And so these guys are trying to make him their king, and that's when he withdrew to a mountain because they were going to sidetrack his plans. Have you ever sidetracked God's plans with your own agenda? We're not even to the picnic yet, are we? But to have an amazing picnic, you have to have a great host, and Jesus was a great host. Um, to have a great picnic, you have to have a great setting. But hey... To have a great picnic, you've got to have the right people, right? You've got to have the people. Now, as we look at the, at the people here, um, I, I want to throw out to you this, this, this idea because people can make or break your, um, your picnic. They can make or break uh, the setting that you're in. So we have, uh, we have the people that, that are there. And where are the disciples in all this? So the disciples are there, and let me recap, they get out of the boat, I'll sum up, they, they get out of the boat, um, Jesus has compassion on them, he's healing them, um, and then it's starting to get late, and so what are we going to do, we have all these 10,000 people out here in the middle of nowhere, this is the remote place, remember, that they were going to, and we have all these people out here, and so the disciples get their heads together, and they say, hey, we can't sustain this, um, Let's, let's tell Jesus to dismiss everybody. And, and so this in verse 15, notice this in, John, in Matthew chapter 14, his account of it. That evening the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Uh, I don't think that the disciples are being rude. Uh, there's other places in Scripture where they were rude, but not here. I think they were just being hospitable actually. Hey, we can't take care of these folks. Um, Jesus, you've got the floor. Why don't you just tell them real quick? I'll, everybody go, go home or, or you know, go into the villages and get some food or whatever. Um, and so Jesus has another idea. And that's interesting. Jesus often has another idea. Uh, notice Jesus' idea, but Jesus said to them, this isn't necessary. You feed them. 
I, I'm, I'm pretending I'm one of the disciples there. And say, I didn't hear that. Did you guys hear? What, did, did he say us? We're supposed to feed them? And there's, there's a buzz going on. It's like, what, what do you mean, folks? Nothing with Jesus is random. Nothing is random. What you're going through right now, it's not random. He has a plan to work in and through you. And sometimes his plan is to work in spite of you. Uh, let me take you back to the 90s. In the 90s, uh, there was this phenomenon that went on um, called promise keepers among men. Uh, and they had, if you guys in the 90s ever went to any promise keepers conference, they were in stadiums all over the place and thousands and thousands of men gathered. And I took, I, I mobilized lots of men to go to all these different conferences. And my, I took my son, Zach. He was, he was, you know, a young teenager during that time. And I took him with me and, and we went, you know, all over the place. It, promise keeper movement died down after a while. I mean, it's still... Uh, existed, but it just died down to the, from the magnitude that it was. And so uh, this past weekend, they, they tried to have one last year, and they did it kind of virtually. Uh, but this past weekend, they started up another one. And it was in a stadium. It was an AT&T stadium in, in Dallas. And my son, who I took back in the 90s, called me and said, Dad, I'm mobilizing some guys to go to this conference. You want to go with me? And I said, Absolutely. And so tables had kind of turned, and now I'm going with him. And so I meet him down there, and, of course, there's going to be golf. All right. So, uh, so he brings his clubs. He said, make sure you bring your sticks. And I said, okay. And so he set up a place for us to play. And it was kind of funny. I was talking to Rhonda. You know, I guess it was Thursday before we left on, I left on Friday morning. And she said, you know, I hear you talking a lot about where you're playing golf and, and you guys getting together. Is there a conference going on there? Um, <laughs> And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, we get there. He set up this tee time at this, um, this golf course in Dallas at, for 1020. And we, my, my flight got in real early. He drove up, drove up from Houston real early. We got to the golf course like two hours before. And so I said, well, let's, what do you say? We just ask and see if we can get off earlier. And he said, okay. So he asked, you know, can, can we get off early? And this girl says, um, I can get you off at 920, an hour earlier, which was going to give us more time on the back end. And um, she said, but you'll be playing by yourself. And we were like, yes. But we said, uh, oh, well, okay, that's fine. You know. And so anyway, uh, we go and get a Coke. And then she comes over where we were getting a Coke just as we were getting ready to go. And she says, oh, plans have changed. Uh, we just had another twosome came up, and they're going to be playing with you. And we see the reason that we don't want to play with anybody is because we're bad. And we don't want them to, you know, you know we don't want to embarrass ourselves. And so... Um, we, and so she said, there's another two that's going to play with you. And we said, great. See, we can fake it. Great. Sure. Yeah. Love people. Lo like to meet some. So anyway, so anyway, we get out there, and, and we're at the first tee, and then up comes these guys, and uh, it's a father-son. And so uh, he's an older guy, and the, other, the, the son is you know, a little bit older than Zach is, and, and uh, ask him about themselves. And the, and the son said, I'm in, I'm in the Air Force. And I'm in, in stationed in North Carolina. I'm retiring soon. And, and uh, you know, all of a sudden, common, hey, I got lots of friends that work at Scott. Uh, we're in, I live in St. Louis area. He said, oh, really? Yeah. And so we talked a little bit. And then I said to the dad, where are you from? He said, I'm from Northeast Missouri. <laughs> Born and raised, Northeast Missouri. I mean, I knew he was from Northeast Missouri when he hit this ball into this little gully. And he said, I hit one in the ditch. I said to my son, that's Northeast Missouri. If you hit it in a ditch. Um, so after, as, as we continued to play, I, I, I discovered, you know, that uh, the dad, his language was extremely colorful. And it indicated to me that probably he did not spend a lot of time in church. And then he started asking us what we were doing there and started talking to him, you know, about this men's conference. I used to take Zach to it, you know, and he's at this church down here. I'm at a church up there. And... and I can't tell you that he prayed to receive Christ and he's now an evangelist. I mean, that did not happen, okay? But there was a seed planted. Nothing, nothing is random. He has his hand, he, he, he is so sovereign that he allows us to be in a position that we can see him work. It's not about you. It's not about me. 
It's not Jesus is the guy who, if I put in my quarter of prayer, he's gonna come through with this relationship. Jesus is the guy, if I put in my 50 cents of church attendance, he's gonna come through for a cure for me. No, no, no. He's gonna work in you and through you in the circumstances that he has you to magnify his name, to make him look good somehow. And so here we have the disciples, and they're saying, hey, what's, what, what are we gonna do? And Jesus says, you feed them. So what do the disciples do? They say, okay, all right, clear your heads. The master said we're supposed to feed them. So what do we got? Let's do the little inventory. Uh, they came up with, long story short, they came up with five, uh, what they call in the scripture, barley loaves, which is kind of like picture five tortillas and, and two sardines. And so they take this to Jesus and they say, They're, what do you think about that? I mean, this is all we've got. Uh, look, look at this real quick in the scripture. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. And look at what Jesus says, bring them here. Another translation says, bring them to me. Folks, if you don't get anything else out of this message today, if you don't get anything out of this series, get this. Whatever it is that is weighing you down in life, whatever chaos and whatever wilderness you're walking through right now, bring it to him. That's what he's saying. Bring it to me. And when you bring it to him, you're going to see something that you've never seen before. I mean, if you just, what they were saying was, we don't have the resources. We just don't have the resources to accomplish this. And Jesus says, what resources you have, bring it to me. Uh, I, I just don't have the personality for that. Bring it to me. I just don't have the finances. Bring it to me. Whatever you've got, bring it to me. Because whatever you've got plus Jesus equals a miracle. You see, but what we do is we hang on to it and we say, this is all I've got and I'm scared to hand it over to Jesus because then I won't have anything. No, 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 no. If you've got Jesus, you've got everything. I want to sum up my whole ministry, not just here, but in my whole life, in one little line. Here it comes. There is nothing more important than Jesus. There is nothing more important than Jesus. I know the world's, you know, going to hell in a handbasket. I know that everything's really, really bad. I know we've never seen it this bad. There is nothing more important than Jesus. Nothing. He's our everything. And if we would fall in love with him, and if we would take what we have and we would just give it to him, he's going to take that. That little faith that you say, here. And he's going to make some amazing things happen. And long story short, you know what happened? Um, they gave it to him. Uh, I don't know if he put it in a barrel and went abracadabra. I don't think he did. I think he took it. I think he blessed it. And they had some baskets around there. And I think he started in the baskets. And then he started pulling out of the baskets. That's just my Tom Hufty visualization of this. And he just kept giving it to him. And then he started letting them be a part of it. You see, God wants to invite a lot of people in his miracles. He wants to invite a lot of people in his plan. And so they started feeding them. And another translation says this, and they fed all of them as, I love this line, as much as they wanted. And then, can you see at this picnic, all these people laying down, man, I'm full. Blah. That was good, wasn't it? I always wanted to do that in church. And then Jesus says, hey, we need to do some pickup. Everybody grab a basket because there's leftovers. And so they go around, and when they come back to Jesus, how many baskets did they have? Twelve. How many disciples? Twelve. One for each doubting disciple to bring back. So how do you do that? How do you take the little resources that you have and give it to him? What's that look like? Here's a passage of scripture from John, and it's not a part of the, the feeding of the 5,000, but, but it tells us how we do that. Yes, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain or stay connected to, stay connected to me, and I in them, and I'm connected to them, will produce much fruit. Things will happen if you're connected to me, is what he's saying. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. You see... 
to have an amazing picnic, you have to have a great host. Jesus was a great host. You have to have plenty of room. You have to have a nice setting. Uh, the people are important. But how about this last thing? This is really, really important, and that is the food. We need food. What do they have? Bread. I don't know what you typically have, but you have, you know, burgers, you know, brats, hot dogs. You know. They had bread. And so there's this connection that is made with the bread. It's, it's very interesting because... Um, John says this one little thing in John chapter 6 about the bread. And uh, actually what he's talking about is he's, he's time stamping this of when this was taking place. He's talking about the Passover. Now, now take, a, take a look at this passage of Scripture real quick. And John just, John just throws this in, okay? He just throws this in. He says in John chapter 6 verse 4, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. He just threw that in. Now, the whole miracle and everything takes place, but John puts a timestamp to it. Now, this timestamp is very significant because bread is very significant, and I want to make this parallel for you, then we'll, we'll bring it down to our own lives, and then we'll, we'll call it good today, okay? So here's, here's the parallel I want you to make. Uh, the, the Passover, Moses was the leader through that, right? And remember what it was? It was uh, he was leading the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And, and where did they go? They went to the wilderness, but they didn't have anything to eat. So God provided this thing called manna. They even called it, what is it? That's what they called it. Uh, it's like when, you know, your mom gives you a, a new dish I want you to try. What, what is it? That's, that's manna, okay? It was a bread type thing, uh, and, and it evaporated. Uh, they couldn't store it, and so they had to trust him every day for, in the wilderness for this heavenly bread. Uh, there was a sea crossing because they escaped from from uh, the chariots of Egypt. Uh, they would cross the Red Sea and they were saved. Um, and then Moses went up to the mountain, had this great experience with God, uh, got alone with God, and, had, and God spoke to him. And that it ended up as a freedom from, from Egypt. Uh, fast forward to what we've been talking about today. Jesus says, let's get away to a remote place. Let's get away where we can clear our heads. Let's get away where we can think. And the people followed him. And uh, these people were hungry. And Jesus provided for them. Uh, heaven's touch on these little, this little bread made an amazing impact. Uh, they, they, crossed, they were crossing the sea. Remember, they were going to this remote place, and, and they see all these people, and it's like pressure is on while they're crossing the sea. And then remember Jesus, when they were trying to do something that wasn't on Jesus' agenda, he went to the mountain to be alone with God. They thought this was the f for freedom from Rome. They, they were going to crown him king to, be, to free them from Rome. It had nothing to do with Rome. You see, Jesus came for you and for me. In the wilderness of this world, it doesn't make any sense to us. And the situations that we get in are the, that seem like a wilderness and chaos and we don't know which way to turn. We don't know how to make decisions. And he says to us, I am the bread of life. I have all you need. I'll be your nourishment. I'll be your shepherd. I'll provide for you. I'll protect you. And you might think right now, I'm, I'm in a sea of confusion. But maybe you came here today and in here, in this worship service, you've discovered a mountain of truth. And it's not to free you from an oppressive government. It's to free you from a sin that might have its grips on you right now. You see, those four writers wanted us to know. You don't predetermine and predecide who Jesus is. This is who he is. He is Savior. He is rescuer. He's a shepherd. He is Lord. Whether you make him Lord or not, he is Lord. There's nothing more important than Jesus. Are you here today? And as you've experienced all this today, when you saw those baptisms, you went in your minds, I remember when I was baptized, that was such an awesome day. I remember who baptized me. I remember some of the things that were said. Or were you saying, I wonder what that's like. 
I was baptized when I was a baby. I don't have any idea what it means to publicly follow him like that, to please him in that way. Every baptism in the scripture was an immersion. I, mean, I don't know what that's like. Are, are you here today and, and there's been a light turned on to a sinful habit in your life? And it's just that. It's a habit. And you know it's destructive, but it's, it brings you temporary happiness. Listen, if you're investing in temporary happiness, you're going to have temporary happiness. But blessed is the one who invests in eternal joy because your joy will be eternal. And that is only found in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes right now? If you are here today and you have this sinful habit that is gripping you, you need to get rid of it. You know you need to get rid of it. It's been hounding you. Could you, in the silence of this moment right now, just admit that God is here and that he's been speaking to you about this? And can you just say to him, God, no more. Just two words, no more. I want this no more in my life. I need your help. I'm bringing it to you. I'm bringing you my weaknesses. I'm bringing you my failures. No more do I want to be controlled by this. Give it to him now. Let him give you victory over that. Perhaps you're here today and you can't go back to a time in your life and remember ever asking Jesus Christ to come into your life, ever committing your life to him. You can do that right now. You can start the journey today. Just simply pray to him right now in your own words, something like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe in you. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead. I ask him now to come into my life and forgive me. Forgive me of all of my sin. Make me part of your family. And help me follow you from here on out. If you prayed that and you meant that with all your heart, the scripture says you have been born again on July 18th, 2021. And your destiny is sealed to go to heaven, but you're not saved just to go to heaven. You're saved to follow him and bring others with you. Would you look this way? If you pray to receive Christ now, or if you have someone you want us to pray for, Maybe it's you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to grab that card that you received when you came in this morning, a little worship guide. That Everybody grab it. Everybody grab it right now. Everybody grab it. Okay. It has a perforated area on it. And on the count of three, I want you to tear that perforated area. Everybody got, you got yours yet? Okay. Even if you colored pictures on it already, I want you to do this, okay? One, two, three. Rip it. Oh, you guys are so good. Our worship team is going to sing us this great song about magnifying Christ in your life. It really goes along great with this message. But what I want you to do during that time while they're singing, I want you to write down a prayer request. Maybe it's for yourself. You don't need to sign it or anything. But maybe it's something that you're going through. Or maybe it's someone that, that hasn't prayed to receive Christ. And you, you, you're not going to give up on them. And so put their name down there. And what we're going to do is you'll, you'll put that in the basket before you leave today. And next weekend, we're going to pray for all of those requests, every one of them, okay? So take time to do that right now while these guys lead us in this meaningful song.
I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be I love that song. Just this weekend, thousands and thousands of men in the AT&T Stadium in Dallas were singing that. Uh, cowboy hats, you know, just, I mean, not, not a choir by any means. But, I don't know, 20, 25,000 probably, I don't know how many it was, standing to their feet, singing Christ Be Magnified. It was a powerful sight. It was really, really neat. Love that song. Thank you guys for doing it. Let's stand together. We're going to be dismissed with his word as our last word as we leave today. Uh, make sure that you take your card and you place it in that basket when you leave. And we'll gather all those prayer requests and we'll be praying for them next weekend. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being here today. Let's say this together. One, two, three. Jesus said to them, come and dine. I love you guys. You're dismissed.